Hey there, I'm glad you clicked on my video. <clears throat> I usually put some music on my videos, but this time I figured I'd try telling you a story. Now whether we've been friends for a while or this is the first time we've met, you're so very important to me, I want you to know that. So I'm going to give you some background on myself, just so we can get to know each other better. I'm from a very, very rural part of Virginia, smack dab in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains. The town is so small that it's not even recognized as a town by the government. It's a CDA, Census Designated Area. We had a stop sign or two, but that was about it. No red lights, lots of churches, Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist churches within spitting distance across from each other. I lived around there for the first 36 or 37 years of my life. Then I met this girl that was from there, but lived in Tennessee. She was visiting her mom when we started talking, and well, you know, now I live in Tennessee. <laughs> that was 12 years ago, and I never looked back. But that's not the story I wanted to tell you. The story I wanted to share with you is a lot more interesting. Most of it's documented. I may put in my opinion. Feel free not to agree. Opinions are like elbows. Most people's got more than one of them. I want to introduce you to an ancient collection of manuscripts gathered together from over 5,000 years and written by over 40 authors. They've been translated over 700 languages with work being done to get them translated into every known language in the world. Amazingly, these manuscripts, while written at different times throughout the 5,000 years by over 40 penmen, all go together as if they were written by one hand. And that's because they were. Do you believe in ghosts? Now, I ain't ever been one to dabble in ghosts and things that go bump in the night. But I believe in at least one ghost. That's the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit of God. This Spirit directed these 40 plus authors in their writings. Then those writings were collected and all put in a binding together. And we call it the Bible. The most purchased book ever written. I know, I know. I can hear you right now. Lord, here we go again with another lecture. I know you've heard all this Bible stuff before. People taking quotes and throwing them out there in hopes they land on someone that's got an interest in them. But don't go nowhere. This is different. I just want to tell you about a man that's in the Bible. So if you ain't got nothing to do for the next 10 minutes or so, sit back, relax, and watch the video and listen to me ramble on. That might be one of the talents that God gave me, talking. I know I talk all the time, so maybe I should use it to glorify Him a little instead of just going on with a bunch of other junk. Okay, so there was this lady, and she was pretty young and had never had a serious relationship with a feller. Well, in her town, this feller took a liking to her and started courting her. But mind you, they didn't just go to bed with each other back in. This was over 2,000 years ago. So her and him was fixing to get hitched. Because, you know, they didn't have sex before marriage. And when he got back home after doing a long carpenter job to make them some money, he went over to her house and was just itching to see her. Imagine his reaction when he found out she was fixing to have a baby. Well, <laughs> he went off to make some money so they could have a wedding and she went to bed with another feller while he was gone. I mean, if she wanted to go to bed with someone, she could have chose him. He'd have slept with her if she'd asked. I mean, he's a guy. But being the kind-hearted feller he was, he wasn't going to let her stay around there where everybody knew her and be pregnant without a husband. So he told her he'd take her summers and quietly put her away. Well, that night he got word from higher up up in heaven that she wasn't lying when she had told him she hadn't been with a man and not only that they told him it was going to be a little baby boy and what to name him he was to raise him and keep him safe because he was going to be something really special 
Now they set out to go to another town because he didn't want her to have a baby there where everybody knew him and knew they wasn't married yet. But he never went to bed with her until after the baby was born. When they got to the other town, there was something going on that had a bunch of people there visiting. And so the hotel was all full. Well, the guy running the place felt sorry for him because she looked like she was fixing to bust. And he told them they could hold up in the animal shelter out back. Well, while they was in there, in that shed, she had the little baby. And so she wrapped him up real good and put him in the trough that the animals eat out of. It made a pretty good makeshift bed for the little fella. I'm sure he didn't care. Now that the baby was here, stepdaddy couldn't keep his hands off mama, so they got hitched pretty soon after this. Now summers were betwixt the age five and eight. Mama and dad took a little tight to the church to have him consecrated cause they was Jewish. While they was there, there was a really holy feller came and started praising God for letting him get to see their savior before he died. I guess this feller had prayed to be able to see the Savior before the end of his life. So anyways, and then there was an old woman that stayed at the church. She was just gloating over this kid like she'd never seen one before. Uh, and she stayed there at the church all the time. She lived there. She prayed all the time and stuff, I reckon. So anyways, all the things these two people said and done, and plus, you know, the other people that were roaming around there, Cause Mama to wonder about the child. She just couldn't get it out of her mind. Well, they did all the Jewish stuff that one usually does at that age when they's Jewish. And they returned to their own town and settled in to raise the child the best they could. And he grew and became strong and wise. And the grace of God was with him. Now, in these manuscripts I'm talking about, there's not really a lot said about this little kid's life as he grows up. Pretty much the next time we hear about him is around 12, and his mom and daddy, they went over to another town to do some Jewish stuff that them that's Jewish do every year. After this Jewish festival is over, mom and daddy packing up everything and start the long journey back to their home. They wasn't no cars back in, so they had to walk everywhere they went. Of course, they traveled with family and friends when they went on this trek once a year. After they traveled a whole day, they realized the boy wasn't with them. They started looking around among their relatives and friends, but couldn't find him anywhere. Imagine traveling for a whole day, not realizing your kid's not there. That sounds like some bad parenting, but knowing who the little kid is, I figure it was done on account of God making it happen. Of course, that's just me hoping it wasn't bad parenting. <laughs> But anyways, they, they went back to the town to see if they could find him. After three more days, now, three days, they finally found him. Now, can you imagine what kind, I imagine what kind of whooping I'd have got from my daddy if that had been me. Golly, he'd have whooped me plumb back to the house. Now, they found him sitting outside the church talking to a bunch of preachers and teachers. There was people gathered around there listening to him, you know. He was asking them all kinds of questions and also listening to their answers like an adult. All the people around there that were listening to them were amazed at how he answered the teacher's questions and of his understanding of their religion. Well, then of course Mama pulls him away and starts asking him why he treated her and Daddy like that and telling him how worried they'd been. But when he asked them why they were searching for him, he said something that shocked them. He said he was doing business for his father. Of course, they didn't understand what he was talking about because his daddy had been looking for him right along with his mama. After they gave him a good talking to, they went back home and he minded them pretty good from then on. They must have busted that little butt on the way home is what I figured. <laughs> But his mama would never forget that day. She treasured it in her heart, listening to him there talking like one of the teachers. You know she was proud of him. She had to be. Now after that, the text don't say much about him for a while. Just that after that day, he grew in wisdom and stature 
and he was in favor with God and man. So everybody must have liked him, and of course God loved him. After the little fella rose up, we see that he has a cousin. Now this cousin's kind of crazy looking guy that runs around the woods hollering and eating grasshoppers and honey from beehives. This guy's name was John, and he baptized people with water. Now that's where you take them by the head and dunk them under the water. Well, one day after the boy became a man, I think he was about 30 year old, he goes down to the water where old John's dunking them one after another. He asks John to dunk him in that water. John's like, dude, I'm paraphrasing here by the way. So John's like, dude, you're the one that should be dunking me. I ain't worthy to tie your shoes. So he talks John into dunking him anyways. And as he's praying, the Holy Ghost came down from heaven. That's the one I believe in. And he kind of transformed into a, like, a, like a living creature, kind of like a dove, it says. And he landed on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven come out, and he told him he loved him, and he was pleased with him, and that he was his son. So everyone around there heard the voice, and they knew it was God. Can you imagine that? Hearing God tell someone, that he's his son? Now John knew that his cousin Jesus was the Messiah. He probably already knew that because John had the Holy Spirit from birth. And Jesus even said, hey, he's the best man ever come from a woman. Because he never done anything. He didn't drink, didn't do nothing wrong. You know, and Jesus come from a woman. So that's pretty high ranking for me. But anyways... So he knew his cousin was the Messiah and he'd come to earth from heaven and been born in human form to save them from sin and death. You see, John had the Holy Spirit from birth, so he sort of had a leg up on everyone. But now he said it was Jesus' time and that he needed to kind of recede into the background and let Jesus take the lead. Now that's the day Jesus started his ministry. Thirty years old, God's son, came from heaven through a human birth. My opinion is he had to do this because you can't kill God's son unless you, he's part human. And also he was showing us what could happen to us if we follow him. We're made from that same flesh as he was. We can be brought back with a glorified body like his too. I could go on and on about Jesus. John said that if all that Jesus did while he was here on earth was tried to be wrote down there wouldn't be enough books in the world to hold it there must be something in God's rules or makeup because we can't understand God and how he works we try to humanize him but we don't have the brains to understand him but there must be something in God's rules or makeup that makes him require a sacrifice in order for him to forgive us for doing bad stuff we don't I don't understand it at all but there's got to be something because that's how he did back then. Well, Jesus came down here and was made in flesh, but was sinless and unblemished. So he was that unblemished sacrifice. So when he sacrificed himself, that paid for all of our sins, past and present and future. If not, we'd have to be out here killing animals and throwing the blood on something or something. I mean we'd have no hope. So when he sacrificed himself, that paid for it. They paid for all of it. And if we live to please him, we've got to try to live to please him. We can reap the rewards of that salvation. We're all flesh and blood. Not perfect and can't be sinless like Jesus. It's impossible. But when we mess up, he's there to forgive us. And when the end times come, we will be brought back with immortal bodies like Jesus was. He went through the process so we could see how it works. He come, he was born, he died, he was resurrected, and he went back to heaven. And now he sits on the right hand of God. You can do stuff like exercise and eating right, but all you'll have is a healthy dead body when you die. If you follow Jesus and love God and other people, you will be raised immortal. Now there's all kinds of religions out there that believe this and that, but there's no use fighting over stuff that don't matter 
Don't focus on all that stuff and miss the big picture. Love God and love people, and that fulfills the law. There's no use splitting all the churches up because you're trying to find one that you agree totally with. That church is just a building. We are the church. We are God's kingdom. I thank you for listening and watching this video. I'm going to have some more, and I'm going to start where I left off for Jesus, and I'm going to tell some more stories. If you all want to stay tuned, if you do, subscribe and hit that bell so you'll get a notification when I put the next part up. I appreciate y'all. Remember, you're one of a kind, and I love you. God bless.